Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to get the Finance Committee meeting started. It is now 8.05. I'm going to share my screen, so just bear with me for one second here. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Looks good. Okay, so we're going to start with the first item on the agenda, and this is just a discussion item. Uh, so we wanted to discuss uh, with the committee uh, we've been uh, discussing and talking about possibility of purchasing district vans. Uh, we're currently researching that. Um, just some reasons why we're looking into this is the primary use for at least two of them um, would be for athletics and activities on occasions when um, there's times and it, it doesn't happen crazy often, um, like during the playoffs and everything, but there are times when we do transport because the team is small or there's one or two uh, student athletes that make states or make districts or whatever, you know, have to travel. Um, there's times when a bus transports a small number of people where it would uh, be more cost effective and better uh, for the coach to be able to drive a district vehicle to take the team up. And if it's an overnight trip, it then doesn't um, have us driving buses back and forth uh, to the events. Um, so there's some cost effectiveness to it. Um, and there's some ease of lightening up the load on transportation um, with some of these events. So right now we are just researching it, uh, but we wanted to have the discussion at the committee level uh, to kind of get a temperature check or a feel on what your thoughts would be, or if you would uh, have any objections to us researching this. Currently, right now, there's the availability is um, there, everything's back ordered on the standard uh, vans that normally get purchased. So it's not like this is something we're rushing to do. We're just starting the research and the possibility of it. And then uh, the other part with just like everything else that's happening right now, the pricing, our expectation is that uh, vans are usually around the price range of 42 to 45. Right now, those prices are coming in at 67 to 72. So that's a little bit higher than we would expect to pay, but right now the market is what the market is. Um, so another possibility we're researching is possibly looking at used vans, maybe a couple of years old, um, because again, it's not like these vans are gonna be on the road day in and day out and being used for routes and things like that. It's more of the flexibility for transport, uh, for activities as well. There's times where field trip happens, where it would make more sense for a van to be used uh, by the student advisor or the teacher to take a small group of students instead of having a big bus transport the students. So we're researching and we'll keep an eye on the market. Um, the funds to purchase the vans would come out of capital reserve if we move forward with that. Obviously we would, when we were ready or if we found correct pricing or found a used van or something that we were felt comfortable to move forward with, we would bring it back to the committee um and have the deeper conversation but we kind of wanted you know before we go all in with the research wanted to get some opinions or some feedback Kara, that that sounds like it makes a lot of sense um i guess does this also add to the flexibility of who the driver can be or is there uh, the same licensing required for no it's not the same good question it's not the same license as a, a bus driver they don't have to have a cdl license so it does provide flexibility they would have to uh, be put on our approved drivers list um, under our insurance piece so there's a process for that so um, and, so could it actually be a coach doing the driving if they ended up on and, and actually reducing the number no okay. okay that is correct yes all right and so that that would <clears throat> help with actually having the people to do it and and also taking off the wear and tear of the larger vehicles over longer distances um i would expect that that is correct and then it also for um some of the trips um and some of the student athlete trips there are times where there are overnight trips mm -hmm. and i'll use swimming as an example where not all of the students are participating in the meet at the same time so if there's multiple vans up, it gives the coaches the flexibility to be able to transport kids and everybody doesn't have to go at one time mm -hmm. or you don't have a bus going, a big bus going back and forth transporting, you know, throughout the day. So it gives that flexibility with that and it gives the flexibility of overnight being able to feed the students and everybody not have, you know what I mean? It, it 
it provides that flexibility, which is good. That makes sense. So, sounds sounds good to me. And you answered my question about used vehicles before I had a chance to answer it. So it's great. <laughs> yeah. Kara, what size van are we looking at? Uh, I believe 15 passenger. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Yeah, the <clears throat> it's more of a request. Um, I think the cost is pretty reasonable, obviously, relative to any larger transport or a bus. I would just want to make sure when you do come back with the research that we have like a fulsome cost benefit analysis so that we can say with, you know, straight eyes that we said, uh, you know, this was a investment in creating a set of benefits. Um, and then over time, do those benefits actually help offset some of that cost or the investment that we made? And I don't think it needs to be a one-to-one -one because of the, you know, the intangibles like additional drivers, but um, it would be really valuable to see that side by side. Okay. That is not a problem. And, um, I just got word from Mr. Bray. So thank you, Mr. Bray, who is on the, um, who is on the meeting. Um, as an attendee, uh, it's, it would be a 10 passenger, not 15. 15 is illegal for okay. school use. So he just corrected me. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so if there's no other feedback or comments, um, we'll move forward to um, what I think everybody's been waiting for anxiously, <laughs> the first <laughs> look at the 2023-24 proposed budget. Um, again, these are repeater slides when I do presentations so that we know um, what we're building the budget for and what our goals and values are when we're creating these budgets. Um, the budget process timeline, where we're at right now, is obviously we're at the March 9th. This is your uh, full review of the budget. Um, we are anticipating having another committee meeting on April 20th, um, where we will look at the proposed final budget. As I've said in the past, I do not anticipate that there will be changes from the proposed final to the final. So um, the next go, the next look at the budget um, on April 20th, that's normally where we land. I'm not saying that there's not flexibility to make some changes if needed, but normally um, that's, that's where we land and it's our final budget. Um, because we're following the state guidelines, as you know, um, the board has to approve the proposed final budget. There has to be a 30-day window in between the approval of the proposed final budget and the uh, approval of the final budget. So this year, I backed up just to give us a, a little bit of wiggle room. We have until June 30 to uh, approve the final budget. So I wanted to make sure, just in case, you never know if anything happens, um, the anticipation is we will approve our final budget June 6th. Then that gives us another meeting if necessary. Um, it it kind of gives us a little bit of cushion if we have to back it up to um, another meeting. So that's the timeline and that's where we're at. Again, this is a repeater slide that just shows the history of Act 1 index, our MVPI aid ratio, and our increases um, since 2015-16 when Act 1 took effect. As you, uh, just as a reminder, the Act 1 index for this year is 4.1%. That is the uh, legal, the, the limit that we can raise taxes without exceptions or voter referendum. So I'm going to get right into the revenue assumptions. We talked about this at the last meeting. I kind of gave a 30,000 foot overview uh, so I can go into some more detail now. Um, again, our real estate tax revenue, if you remember, I said our assessed value went up um, from prior year, almost 2%. Um, some information on what drove or pushed that assessed value up. We are, see, we are starting to realize some of our taxes on the tax rolls from two big developments that happened, and that's the Squires Ridge um, development. It was 32 single family attached and detached homes and the Falcon Hill 32 family detached development. So those properties were built, um, starting to sell, and those homes are um, now on the tax rolls. So that's something that is pushing the increase in our assessment, overall assessment in our township. The other thing is um, people doing upgrades to their homes. 
Um, I don't know if you drive down Bergen, but uh, Dr. Yannacone and I talk about this, but it, it seems like everybody is refacing their homes with siding. So those things will drive assessment values up if they pull permits from the, um, from the township. Um, that could trigger a reassessment depending on the depth of work that's being done in a home. So that's a positive for us. Um, we're looking at a 3.5% increase, tax increase. That's an assumption that's built into this budget being presented. It is providing us with an additional $1,659,840 of tax revenue. Um, I went over this before the value of a mill. Um, and then I also broke it down so that you can see for every 0.1% of an increase, a tax increase, what it will generate and what it will do for our millage rate. So if you wanna kind of play with the numbers up and down, you can add or subtract based upon the 0.1%. Uh, our collection rate, which is a very positive thing, is at 98.5%. Um, that's a very strong collection rate um, to have against our taxes. So that also is driving up our tax revenue. So those are very positive things for us. Our real estate transfer tax, I explained this before, Obviously the housing market is doing very well, uh, it's booming. So as the housing market goes up, that number goes up because more houses sell. So we get a half a percent of that. Um, so that continues to um, rise and fluctuate a little bit. I'm conservative with that because as the housing market goes down, that number will naturally come down. So looking at a five-year historical trend, we average about 700,000 a year so that I can certainly budget that even if we end the year a little bit higher. Um, earned income tax, I talked about this last meeting um, that we are seeing an increase in that over the last few years. Um, it's a high, almost 38% increase. Again, that's attributed to the fact of employers um, wanting to retain and recruit employees and the competitive uh, market out there for employees right now. So again, as employers pay their staff more money, um, that number increases. State on the state, uh, another thing that's not listed here, but I did want to mention was our earned, um, our interest earnings. That is something that uh, I budgeted very conservatively last year, because as everybody knows, the market was not that great for investment. Um, at the time. Since the feds have increased the interest rate, obviously more opportunities for investment has come to fruition. So um, Sam and I have done a, a very aggressive job of making sure that we are investing our funds uh, appropriately according to our policy. And we have had a windfall of increased revenue on that line item. So that'll be something, that's something that I increase going into this budget as the market continues um, to stay stable in that area. Um, on the state revenue side, again, um, I, I said this in previous presentations, I reflect the current year allocations. So right now in this budget, it's reflecting the 22, 23 allocations. Um, if you didn't listen to it, Governor Shapiro did pro provide his budget address. Um, he is looking to invest into education and continue along to, uh, Governor Wolf's uh, trend. Um, if his budget were to pass, um, which I'm sure there will be a lot of discussion on, um, we would uh, get approximately $200,000 additional if it was fully funded as presented. Um, so right now I'm sticking with our 2022-23 allocations um, with the understanding that if his budget is fully funded, we could have a little bit of an increase in there. Retirement and social security subsidies are adjusted according to overall salaries. So that's something that goes up as uh, salaries go up. On the federal side, our title funding, same thing, reflects our 22-23 allocations. Um, and then also the ARP and set aside ESSER funds, which um, have to be spent um, and allocated by September of 2024 are reflected into this budget um, based upon anticipated use. So looking at all of those assumptions, here is a snapshot of where we were last year of where our current year approved budget is versus what the proposed budget. You'll see that it is an increase of 7.88% overall. You'll see um, on the third column with the difference where we're seeing the increases and decreases in individual line items. 
I want to highlight on the current real estate tax area that I just said that uh, our anticipation is to increase by 3.5%. So if you're scratching your head and saying, why is it 7.44%, um, there's additional revenue being generated because of the increase in our overall collection rate and our overall assessment. So before we even apply um, the tax increase to that, um, those two count those two things that are part of the calculation naturally went up so that increases the addition the revenue that we're generating from our taxes. The other areas that you see the um the positives on are the areas that I've discussed that 880 and other local revenue, what's driving that is our um interest earnings. Are there any questions on this slide at this point? I have a quick, just a quick question of where the ESSER funds live. Is that in other federal revenue? Yes. And the reason that it went down is because ESSER 2 is spent. Like we went through the ESSER 2 funds. So in this past year's in this current budget, we had ESSER 2 funding in there as well as some of the ARP ESSER. Since we've completely spent and that um, ESSER 2 funding has to be spent by September of 2023, um, that's peeling off of our Fed, and we are continuing on with now just the ARP ESSER and the set-aside funds. And I don't, I don't need the detail now, but that will happen over the next two years, right? We'll see a, a tranche drop off in terms of revenue from the Fed. Um, right. Just, it would be helpful to have the relative impact there, because as we think about the potential positive impact of Shapiro's new budget proposal um it's probably just going to be an offset um maybe not even an offset depending on the size of the s or tranche correct okay okay any other questions or comments okay it looks good thank you okay so we're going to get into the expenditure assumptions and we're going to start we like revenue increases that's good yeah it is very good very positive <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to look at contractual obligations, um, which I've said accounts for about 88.5% of our overall budget. So the big one is salary and benefits, obviously. So on a very positive side, we um, successfully uh, settled our STA contract or teacher's contract, which will go into effect July 1 of 2023. Um, I outlined here because we've, um, over the last two years, um, negotiated and settled successfully contracts um, with all of the areas that are listed here with all of our groups. So what I wanted to do is peel in, just as a reminder, um, the new monies that um, these the settling of these contracts are generating so that you can see that. So you can see with the STA contract, we'll be going into our first year in the 23-24 budget, and it's about uh, 1.35 million of new funds um, based upon the increases um, on the salary and benefit side. Um, and I won't go through all of them, but you can see the impact of each of the successfully negotiated agreements or contracts um, on that area. Um, under new positions on salary and benefits, um, we will, um, even though uh, Ms. Shraj is, uh, was hired this year. It, her salary will fully be realized in the 23-24 budget as a new position. Um, we are looking um, for a psychologist um, and also the elementary music teacher for the strings program. So those are new positions that got introduced into the 23-24 budget. Other Contractual obligations are leases and rentals. The, the big part of the leases, obviously, are our Chromebook leases. Um, we have since cycled so that all of our leases aren't on the same cycle so that we don't have to get that big hit all at one time. Um, so in the upcoming, um, and you'll see on the next slide, in the upcoming budget, we are addressing Erdenheim, the three through five students. If you recall, last year we approved doing the middle school, so they were done. The high school was done the previous year before that. So we're just cycling each year so that we're on different schedules um, with all of our uh, buildings. We have educational and operational license renewals, um, custodial and security services. As you know, we're going out to RFP for both of those services. Um, substitute services, uh, and with those three services, uh, just with inflation and with the market right now, we are seeing and expecting increases in those areas. 
Um, athletic training services, we have discussed that uh, previously, our utilities and our debt service. So all of those areas, um, I'm, I'm sad to report, we are seeing increases in all of those areas. <laughs> The expenditure assumptions, um, just so that you can see what's being incorporated into um, our proposed budget. So these are new things that weren't in in the previous year. Um, on the curriculum side, we have K-8 math renewal. So that's materials. It, it's just the renewal of the materials. We have K-5 through ELA. Um, that'll be curriculum writing, training, and material purchase. K-5 science materials, um, that'll be material purchased to align to newly issued state standards and changes in state testing. Um, six through eight science materials, nine through 12 science materials, K through 12 health and PE materials, and then the elementary strings resources um, and materials. So under curriculum, that's a heavy lift. So um, there are funds that have been allocated in this budget um, to address um, the materials and resources and training for those areas. Under the technology side, as I just mentioned, um, we were looking to uh, upgrade the grades three through five Chromebook devices. They are currently four years old. If you remember last year, we trickled down the middle school ones to get us through last year and replace some of those devices at that level. Um, so now they're up for, for new Chromebooks. Um, we are also looking at um, a SIS student information system. So we're looking at PowerSchool and Schoolology. Um, and then year two of cybersecurity with our five-year plan. If you remember the first year, um, which was the upfront cost for a lot of the cybersecurity plan, that was covered by the ARP ESSER funds. So now as we um, start to do renewals and everything else, that has been built into the technology budget so that we can maintain and continue along our cybersecurity. Um, we continue to utilize the ARP ESSER funds. If uh, This is just a reminder, this will be year two of salary and benefits um, for the two special ed teachers and the two math specialists that we hired um, last year. We'll continue with student interventions, social emotional learning, for student support and staff development and mental health support. So those, that's how those funds are being utilized in this upcoming budget. On the facility size, we have ongoing district-wide preventative maintenance. Um, we have phase one of capital projects, including the high school partial roof replacement um, and the middle school building and field renovations. The reason I'm putting this here, even though it's being um, funded out of a bond, what impacts our general fund budget is that it's being funded through a bond issuance. So we're gonna have an increase to our debt service of about $575,000. So that's the impact that it has on this budget. And before I move off of this slide, um, I don't know if Dr. Yannicone wanted to add anything to the areas that I was speaking on about curriculum. Uh, thanks, Kara. Sure, I'll just uh, highlight a couple of areas. Um, the K5ELA, you may remember a number of years ago, we purchased Journeys and our online license uh, for Journeys will expire at the end of next year and they are not renewing that particular edition. So there'll be a full review of the K-5 uh, ELA curriculum and then we'll be purchasing something different. And that you may recall from a number of years ago was a pretty heavy lift that first year. Uh, in order to purchase the resources. So we've allocated some significant funding for ELA. And then because of the next gen science standards, next generation science standards at the state level, there is um, a fairly significant change in expectations around science education. And so we're looking at a really a full K to 12 uh, potential for purchase. So we've allocated significantly more money in the curriculum budget this year than we have in the last few years. Um, it's a bump because we're doing both departments, ELA and science at the same time. Um, we will need the renewal and envision, and hopefully that'll be less of a bump. And health and phys ed will be dependent upon, quite frankly, whether or not we feel we can manage it, not only from a financial standpoint, but also um, the ability of our curriculum office to attend to all four areas. And so um, some of this is work that had been delayed um, at the state level and at the district level through the pandemic. But we're trying to get back on track and not wait 
in these areas. Um, and then previously at Academic Affairs, we had given a presentation on the cost for the elementary strings program. And it was about $65,000 in the first year because we have to purchase the equipment. Currently we have, um, we're approaching about 70 elementary students who have expressed an interest in playing uh, one of the four instruments. And so we'll be um, purchasing instruments to have on hand and then also allowing families um, to have access to other materials that are necessary to start up the program. Um, so those are, are really under curriculum. I wanted to make sure you understood what we were thinking there. And then um, Kara mentioned the Chromebooks. We're looking at the possibility of Chromebooks that may have touchscreen capability or uh, a stylus for the elementary school because of the transition coming out of iPads and into Chromebooks. Um, they might cost us a little bit more than what we're currently um, using at our secondary level. Power School um, is a little bit more expensive than eSchool, but has more robust features. And you may recall, this is one of our district goals to um, improve our student information system. And so um, looking at Power School and the potential to add the LMS, this would be uh, a layover to Google Classroom with Schoology, where teachers could continue to use Google Classroom and the resources they've created over the years, but they would have a more robust um, system in their learning management system and families would be able to have greater access to information, which we've talked about. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight the things on the left side of that screen because I feel like there's a lot there. And we've had conversations in the past about making choices in the budget. And these are all choices um, that we are currently incorporating. But if the board at any point felt that we needed to slow down or make adjustments to the budget um, going into next year, this is where we would probably make some, some tweaks. Any questions about that? Mary Jo, um, yeah. it's Karen, can you hear me? Yes. Um, how does this align with the, um, you know, I know that there's a, a curriculum rotation review um, and we do that to spread things out um, for staff and for the budget. And I'm just curious as to where that, how this aligns with that. Absolutely, we are on schedule. If you account for the two years of the pandemic, where we were not continuing um, in particular in science. So we had a slowdown in science, but the, the primary reason for the slowdown was actually not the pandemic. It was that the state was waiting to release the next generation science standards and their um, recommended adjustments uh, to the content. And so the textbooks that we currently have and you want science textbooks in particular at the secondary level can be expensive. Um, <clears throat> whether you're purchasing the online version or the hard copy, it doesn't matter. They're the same, um, uh, same cost. But that's really what slowed us down and pulled science back from where it should have been uh, several years ago. ELA we knew was coming at the end of 24, at the end of the 23-24 school year, because uh, the company that runs Journeys had let us know that they were discontinuing that edition. And so um, it's going to be not only the purchase of the resources and materials, but also the training that we're going to uh, likely contract with either the intermediate unit or another resource, because the, it's not going to be the same resource. And as you probably know, there's been quite a bit out there on science of reading and balanced literacy. So we want to make sure we're using um, best practices, current best practices. So there's going to be quite a bit of training for the staff um, through that transition. Okay, thanks. Appreciate of course. It. Yep. And Jeff, I think your hand's raised. Yep. I just had a question on when we purchase a new curriculum. And I just don't remember how, how this happened with Journeys. How much impact is there in this year's budget? And then what is the ongoing commitment? Does it, will the <laughs> licensing cost increase on an annualized basis switching to a new curriculum? Yeah, it's actually the reverse. So the licensing, there's an upfront initial purchase that's higher, and then it decreases over time. Um, <clears throat> and so that's what we're hopeful for here. That's the same thing with elementary strings. That 65000 is the highest. The cost drop every year down to about $9,000 over the first five years. I think in the fifth yeah. year, we're at about 9000 
Got it. So well, each of these the initial upload, right? Yeah, so each of these choices will have a one year, very significant impact, but it will taper in the out years. That's correct. The other advantage we feel um, in making these purchases next year is that on the right hand side of the screen there, you see the RBSR. And as Kara mentioned, next year is our last year of anticipated funds. Unless the federal government makes a change, we anticipate that those funds will need to be spent and there will not be new funds added um, by September of 24. Yeah. So Kara and I have worked, and frankly, more Kara than me, to make sure that we're um, smoothing the budget in subsequent years, in 24, 25, and 25, 26, so that if we decide that it's appropriate for us to continue to have the two math specialists at the elementary level and to continue to have additional special education support, um, that we can absorb that into the budget without a big hit um, to our overall costs. Okay, helpful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, any more questions on this slide before I move forward? Okay. So how this all translates into um, all these assumptions, how they translate um, into the budget are these uh, line items. So you will see, just like I did with revenues, a snapshot from this year's approved budget to the proposed budget, and you'll see the difference. So one of the reasons that I wanted to make sure that I highlighted um, the uh, contracts and that we've successfully negotiated them um, is because of the swing um, in difference of salaries and benefits. So part of that uh, number is attributed to uh, the fact that we did settle new contracts, the biggest one being the teacher's contract. On top of that, um, with the new money that's added, we had to add in some benefit and payroll costs, such as PEASERS. Even though PEASERS has gone down this year, we experienced, uh, and, and they were very quick to make sure they sent out notification that this was a one-time decline. We should not expect this in subsequent years, that it, uh, it'll start to rise again, but it, it kind of reset where we're rising from. So PEASERS did decrease um, from 35 and some change down to 34. So that is a big positive. Um, but they they did they were quick to tell us not to expect that every year. Um, so, but even still with that, with new salaries and new monies coming on, um, those were not attributed into the budget at the PEASERS rate of 34%, even though that went down. Um, so along with the new funds and the increases in some of our benefit costs, um, that is the difference that you see at that 6% um, increase on our salaries and benefits. Um, the school budget you'll see had an um, increase of about $264,000, which is about 26% increase. Um, the departments um, you'll see had about a 12% increase. And again, as Dr. Yannicone indicated, and we just saw in that previous slide, a heavy lift of that is the curriculum piece. There's the curriculum piece. Um, there's some built in for technology. Um, and then also on the side of facilities um, with the security services, custodial services and our utilities expecting to increase. That's where you see this increase in the department budgets. And then you have this other category, um, which if you see the footnote, it explains what other means because it's it's a uh, million dollars worth of other funds. So I wanted to make sure that that was very clear. Um, so the big lift in this other expenditure account that doesn't fall under a department or a building is our VOTEC cost. Um, so this is our Eastern cost. Um, the board approves this every year. If you remember that, it's about $800,000. So it accounts for about 66% of that line item number. Also included in here are legal and accounting services at 19%, our board services at 10%, and the business office at 5%. I do not have a department because my... Uh, the, the way that the accounting for it and the structure of our chart of accounts, it doesn't require me to have a separate department. Um, so that's why we're in the other category. Um, and then our debt service, you'll see it's adjusting for um, our current, not only our current structure, but putting the new funding in uh, for the $10 million borrowing that we are looking to do. So overall, um, our increase is a little bit under $5 million at about 7.7%. Putting it all together, we're looking at a, we're recommending a 3.5% tax increase. Um, you'll see that our anticipated overall expenditures are 69,816,832, with our anticipated revenues at 68,401,666, which leaves a difference of one about 1.4 million dollars, um, which we will utilize from fund balance. 
wanted to do a snapshot of some comparison so that you can see. So we went um, 0.25 below and 0.25 above um, where the recommendation is so that you can see the additional revenue and the additional impact on fund balance. Obviously, if we have a smaller um, tax increase, um, it doesn't generate as much uh, revenue and it puts more of an impact on fund balance. You will see the monthly and um, the annual, and I'm sorry, those are reversed. Um, I'll have to fix that. Um, so it should be annual, uh, should be the top and monthly should be the bottom. That's the impact on the homeowner um, for each of the scenarios um, that I presented here. Obviously, if we have a higher tax increase, it generates more money with less impact on fund balance. This is a historical look at our budget um, and our actual. So you can take a look at this and see um, what has been approved. And then um, when our audit comes in, how we've actually fared. Um, and then it shows the impact on our fund balance and where we stand with fund balance. And then the bottom um, shows our tax increase benchmarked against our the Act 1 index. And then just going back through the budget process timeline, the next steps will Ms. be- Ms. Green, I'm sorry. Can you go back to that chart one more time? This one? Yep. This one to linger on the fund balance a little bit more. Sure. Because if you could help explain too, that we, we tapped fund balance last year. Correct. Which was that surplus deficit line? Yes. So we did 1.2 million from fund balance last year. Yes. But With our- change in balance isn't 1.2 it is 1.2 it, it is, is 1.2 yes okay so precise these numbers um so we have only used fund balance to offset increases twice in the last seven years, six years. That is correct. Okay. And as you recall, one of the goals that um, uh, when I presented last year and I, I've spoken with Dr. Yannicone over time is obviously we want to make sure um, at some point that we're able to present a balanced budget where there's no need for use of fund balance. And then if there is a need for fund balance, it's obviously for one-time expenditures. So if we do tap into fund balance, we don't want recurring costs such as salaries or benefits or leases or some of those contractual obligations that we have, but for things that we um, are looking to implement or new programs that we're looking to implement. So obviously our goal is to make sure that, uh, you know, we try to keep our expenditures pacing our revenues. Um, and at this time though, the other goal that we have is to make sure that we come under the Act 1 index so that we're mitigating some of the tax increase by utilizing our fund balance. And as you can see from our fund balance, the health of our fund balance that it we have the availability to do that. Um, and that is why we were recommending that. Um, and that's how we're moving forward with a 3.5. Um, with the robust things that you're seeing in this budget, coming in under Act 1 index and utilizing some of our fund balance. And then if you, if you don't have the number off the top of your head, that's fine. But the how much of the fund balance, that $25 million roughly, is unallocated or unassigned? Um, so if, to give us a sense of like the if, if we pulled 1.4 out, how much of the unassigned balance are we pulling out? I will give you a rough number. Um, if I just take it off of the eight percent, it's a it's two million. So when you go when you look at the legal limit that you can have um, from the state of of what can be unassigned, um, I believe it's about two two million dollars. I don't know exactly what it is. We will get into a deeper conversation at the April twentieth meeting. Um, when we're doing our proposed final budget um, on the different categories that we have in our fund balance and how it is allocated out. Okay. And when we talk in that meeting then, 
I would love to a little bit more instruction on like if we are reducing our unassigned balance, can we do a process of reassigning or unassigning some of the things that are currently assigned? Correct. Like almost like a reprioritization or reallocation. Correct. Um, to ensure that we have future flexibility as well. Yes. Um, if you recall too, um, when we updated our policies, um, one of the policies that we did update and made some changes to was our fund balance policy. Um, and I believe I increased the number from 2% to 4% as the minimum. Um, so what we look to do is to keep our unassigned no higher than four at 4% 4 or higher in between four and 8%. And if it falls below that, then there's action that we do to make sure that our, our unassigned fund balance stays within that range. So we do have a policy to support that. Um, to make sure that we're always in that range. But um, most definitely, yes, we want to make sure that our unassigned um, stays where we need it to within that policy. And if it does fall below that, then we can most definitely take things from the assigned piece of it and reallocate it to unassigned. Great. And then I'm sorry to belabor this, but I think I misunderstood this chart. So in each year when we've had a final budget, we have allocated fund balance as part of the budget revenue, i.e. like to cover expenses. But when things actualized, we've had revenues come in higher than expected. We've had some expenditures come in lower than expected. So in, in most years, we've actually been able to contribute back into the fund balance through higher revenues or lower expenditures. Correct. It's only been two years. And this amount that you're proposing is actually lower than all but one year in the last six years correct okay i misunderstood it now that i reset it that makes me feel more confident okay any other questions on this slide or any of the others i know it's a lot of numbers and a lot of information in a short period of time i can go back if you have any questions or if there's any comments from anybody so and just to go back when when dr anna Cohn was going over um, the expenditure assumptions, the curriculum technology. Um, you had made a comment that if if something were to be cut, it would be cut here. And my question there is, um, what's the impact? The 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 short. And I don't know if there's a you know easy answer to the question, but like, what is the pain to the district to the students? if something would were, were to be cut like what would that cut be what would the first cut be and what what's the actual impact on the bottom line like does it gain us anything or is it just a cut to say there's a cut and it doesn't actually you know help keep the uh, numbers down does that make sense no it no it makes sense <laughs> Um, I think within that group, um, science would probably, among the curricular areas, science would probably be, uh, because it's a heavy lift, mm -hmm. we might delay the purchase of science curricular materials because the ELA, we really don't have a choice. Journeys is going away. Mm -hmm. So we need to prepare the staff for that. And we need to get the materials in the hands of the teachers before we're asking them to teach the students. And so, um, and much the same with math. So I would say science and health and phys ed would probably be delayed, not eliminated, but pushed down the road. So, um, in technology, not... I'm sorry, in technology, we, we could also hold the devices an extra year. We had spoken last year about <clears throat> trying to be on a four-year cycle with four schools, um, both from just a a utility standpoint that four-year-old devices tend not to be as functional um, and five-year even worse. Um, so we would like to stay on this schedule, but in theory, we could delay and continue to use the existing Chromebooks at Erdenheim. Um, we have a little bit of a window to delay a new SIS, but eSchool is being phased out. PowerSchool actually purchased eSchool, absorbed eSchool, <laughs> And so um, we can delay a little, but not too far down the road. Um, we certainly hope to maintain the cybersecurity plan. There's been a lot of, um, of information published about the risks relative to cybersecurity. Um, and then certainly um, 
we have the bond issuance for the capital projects, we could put, we could hold off on some of the facilities projects. We could delay. We, we don't okay. recommend that, but we could in theory. So, so when you going back to curriculum, when you say that you could delay science, um, but but one of the at least for the K for five, we're we're not we're trying to implement new science to meet the new standards. Yes. Um, so, could there be a piecemeal like you do the K through five and then delay the like if the six through 12 is already working for the students, is there a, a dire need to do that this year? Or like what would that impact be if you were to separate them out or is that even possible? Right, well, the, the next gen science standards are K-12. So in order okay. to be, yeah. So uh, piecemeal is not ideal. Could gotcha. we do it in theory? Of course. And, and it may be a situation where Ultimately, we decide that we do need to phase in over two years or three years. But our goal is to have the students uh, meeting current standards. Um, <clears throat> and so our hope is that we'll be able to make these purchases next year. Right. But of course, I mean, yes, we could. And then if Kara goes back one slide further, um, the other area under contractual obligations that we've discussed previously um, we are out to RFP on custodial services, security services. Um, in those two areas, um, when the board and the committee ultimately wants to award a contract, we can talk about the terms of that contract and the extent to which, um, you know, what type of services are we looking for and the scope of those services. As an mm -hmm. example, under security, several years ago, we didn't have security services at the middle school. And we've added those. So we could scale back and not offer the same level of security services um, or choose companies that have a lower um, cost if we were looking to try to tighten up the budget. Um, we also could look at other means of providing athletic training services. These are not, none of these things are things we recommend, but in theory, there are things that the board could choose. Um, we could also choose not to add a fourth psychologist, mm -hmm. um, or we could uh, back off on the strings program. So these are all things that are new in the budget yeah. uh, or anticipated to be increased expenses in the budget. Uh, some of the areas that we really don't feel like we have any flexibility at all would be things like utilities, substitute services are what they are. <laughs> um, so, and then the educational and operational license renewals, there might be a little wiggle room in there on um, the types of licenses that we have, um, but not much. And so, uh, and then obviously the salaries and benefits, these are contracts we have in place. So there's no flexibility there. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the uh, that discussion. A absolutely. And I do want you all to know that um, while it was our, you know, our intention was to come in um, roughly half a point below index um, with the use of fund balance, but we could always utilize more fund balance if the board decided that you were comfortable with that in next year's budget. And obviously, Karen and I are hopeful that over the next six weeks, we can continue to um, refine our presentation and we'll do our best to continue to lower the tax increase. We understand that that's all of our goal, that the community will have the lowest tax increase necessary in order to continue to offer a really high quality program. Okay. Um, I just, just a comment and I'm not sure, you know, kind of what the, where, where this goes right now, but the, the jump between 2.8 and 3.5 feels uh, big to me um, in, in terms of an inc tax increase. Um, but I, you know, I certainly do see value for <laughs> all of the things that you've made, um, you know, made a case for, um, so I, I don't know, just, a, am not sure where to go with that actually it just feels big. It, it's, it is a challenge and, and we have discussed it, um, expenses, as you know, costs for everything have gone up. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. um, just as families, are experiencing increased costs, so is the district. Everything that we are, um, you know, uh, fuel fees for the bus fleet are exorbitant relative to what they have been in the past. And as we discussed earlier this year, 
Um, our STEA contract is a fairly significant increase in one year. <clears throat> and that is largely due to the fact that we were not at a competitive level. And we've now moved with this new contract, our staff into um, the middle of the pack relative to you know competitive salaries. We've moved to county averages. Mm -hmm. And with the staffing shortages that we're seeing all over, that was an important increase to the budget um, mm -hmm. in order to make sure that our, our teachers and counselors and psychologists feel uh, well compensated for really good work. So mm -hmm. that's just some of the areas that we've discussed. But in every single line, costs have increased. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I guess I think similar to what Karen is feeling, I think that's what <clears throat> is prompting me to ask these questions as well. But obviously, underlying it all, the Act 1 index is significantly higher this year for a reason, mm -hmm. and that's because these costs are up. Um, going back to, you know, the vision for the district and our, and, and our goals, um, uh, you know, everybody wants our schools to perform better. We want higher rankings. We want <clears throat> the children to have a fantastic education. So all of these costs have to come from somewhere, you know, and, and I guess if there's, I don't guess, if there's, we, we trust that there's good reasoning for all of these programs and, and it's not just a matter of trust, you guys do the research and you uh, you back everything up. Um, um, I guess anything we cut this year and push off to the future, we're kicking the can down to a potential higher cost later on, as we've seen with delaying things like bus purchases. Anyway, that sort of can fit into any category. We can't predict future prices. Um, so, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, one example of, uh, I don't want to suggest that anything was uh, kicked down the road, but one of the fairly expensive costs of uh, this year, next year, and the following year are the the roof sections that are coming off warranty. Yeah. Those are not small bills. Uh, you know, we're talking about just under $2 million just for the section of roof at the high school next year. Yeah. And that was part of that bond issuance. So yeah. Um, we do have some fairly significant facilities costs as well. Yeah. Well, and when we talk about things like delaying Chromebook purchases, just as a, we're all users of technology now, and we all know how frustrating it is when things don't work. Um, and just seeing how, like my kids who are good with technology, just seeing them struggle sometimes with an online portal or, you know, the hardware itself, I, I would, I would hate to Mm -hmm. impact our youngest learners with struggles on, on technology. And I think you're uh, backing up the transition between the iPads to a non-touchscreen. Like as a touchscreen user myself, if I get to a computer, it doesn't have, I'm like one of those people that's just, why isn't it respond? And that's, we don't need that frustration when these kids are trying to learn. Um, so yeah, but, I understand. Yeah. I mean, our analysis was that four years is, is a, is a healthy transition point to upgrade technology and works for us as well from a budgetary standpoint because um, we're not looking at ups and downs where all of a sudden we're, we get to a point where technology isn't working and we need to make a larger purchase. It's roughly across the four buildings, uh, similar uh, number of Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more obviously in the high school year because we have an extra grade, but it allows us also to, to have a, a flat, uh, planning for Chromebook purchases across at least K K two three five six eight. The uh, security services that were increased at the middle school, um, mm -hmm. I trust that we're seeing an impact from that. With you know last year all the drama and that we we heard about the problems, so I, I, I um, that that's yeah. working out well. Yes, I think two things that we added. One is the security services and the other is our uh, second assistant principal. I think the increase in uh, ability to be visible and present <clears throat> um, is evident with the data we have, which is that it's been a very, I, I hesitate to say it because it's March, but it's been a very quiet year um, across the schools. We also increased security services at the high school in particular with the afternoon and evening. Um, you may or may not recall that there was conversation about needing some security services in the after school hours because we have so many activities going on. Yeah. And so, um, and beyond that, we've also, um, we are, you know, to be, you know, fully transparent here, we're out to RFP. 
but yeah. every company is also experiencing the same shortages in staff. And so whether it's athletic training services, subservices, security, custodial, every one of those companies is increasing their costs to the user, meaning us, um, because they have to pay their staff a higher hourly rate. Perhaps they have to pay benefits where maybe they didn't pay entirely in the past. So anywhere we go for services or materials, the costs have increased. Um, and as you mentioned a few moments ago, the index, I think, being at 4.1 is a reflection of the fact that there is an expectation, and Kara talked about this at the very beginning, under um, the much more fun revenue assumptions, that um, that the uh, wages have gone up. Yeah. And so, and home values have gone up. So we've seen an almost 2% increase in the assessed value in the community, and then we've seen an increase in wages. So the reason why the index has gone up and I agree with Karen, it's a fairly significant index jump from one year to the next. Um, <clears throat> and it's gonna be another jump next year anticipated. Um, th those jumps are reflective of what is an expected increase in wages, but we're trying to continue to be really thoughtful about how we, the budget we ultimately bring forward and the balance again of the tax increase relative to the fund balance. So again, there is an opportunity if the board would like to use a higher percentage of the fund balance in order to offset a tax increase. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Sorry, go ahead, Neil, if you want to. No, I'm, 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 I'm good, thank you. Um, wanted to follow up on, on both Dr. Tarotuski and Mr. DeFranco's comments um, and suggest like one follow up on this and would love feedback from Neil and Karen. Um, we were at 2.8 last year for a tax increase and uh, the index is 4.1, like a 3.5% recommendation literally splits the difference um, between what index says we could do and where we were in actual. Um, so I actually think in an inflationary environment, that's not unfair to like really think through that splitting of a difference, like as a starting point. So I appreciate you guys landing there rather than something closer to index. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm doing the rough math correctly, like even the STEA contract impact is about a 3% increase in taxes, right? It's 1.3 million increase. The 3.5 is giving us 1.6 million in new revenue. So it's that, that that's a huge impact. And that doesn't take into account all the new curriculum, the new string programs, the positions that you've created, and all of the increase in costs associated with running the school on a day-to-day -day basis. Like it, which is why the increase in cost is actually 7 point whatever percent. Um, so I think you guys have been pretty disciplined in coming back with keeping costs in check to where we could, but to pressure test this whole thing, what I'd love to do is like throw out a wild benefit to our taxpayers and say, what if we, what if we tried to do a full point below index, which would be a 3.1% increase if I'm, if I'm right. The difference between the 3.5 and 3.1 using Kara's handy dandy mill rate calculator is, is under $200,000. And so as a follow-up, I would love for you guys to come back and say, we could tap the fund balance for $200,000 more. And where does that line up against our historical fund balance tap rate, <laughs> whatever, whatever you want to call it? Or... Here's exactly where we would remove the requested increases from the budget so that we can keep the fund balance tap rate at what we had recommended, right? So that we can actually make a choice between cutting investments versus tapping the fund balance. And then we'd love some dialogue and like, does it matter in our fund balance? Is that a good or bad use of fund balance? Because I don't think... I don't think that $200,000 is, is that hard to solve for in a $69 million budget. And that could be, um, you know, just from a comparative tax increase and what we've done historically feel much better to just be, you know, a 3.5% you know, 
point increase rather than a, you know, where whatever the math would 3. be. 3.5, we were, they gave us 3.2, 3.5, 3.75, yeah. or 3.25, 3.5, yeah. 3.75. Mm -hmm. um, so that to me would feel like we've really done full due diligence if we take that one additional step. But Neil, Karen, how do you, how do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do feel like at least looking at if we took a, like kind of the lowered that hit, like what would that hit look like to our programming and our goals? And um, just to, you know, to fully consider the impact of, of lowering the, uh, the tax rate, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, going back to the budget history um, and, you know, looking at how the hit on the fund balance was significantly higher in so many of the years. Mm -hmm. um, and then what it actually worked out to be. And then even backing up <clears throat> to the revenues and, you know, like the, with the keeping certain things, Yeah, I, I I think I I would I would love to see those numbers. I would love to see that at mm -hmm. the three point one and 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 see what the actual what it would look like. Um, mm -hmm. And th this is oversimplifying, but you know, there's a little bit of risk I think in the current collection rates. If we if we God forbid went into an actual recession in our overall economy, that that could that could be damaged, which um wouldn't help but we have the upside of the new state proposal which mm -hmm. could be benefit right so even if that in that two hundred thousand dollar range like that, that that could be made up for by the state budget but i don't i don't want to bank on either of those things so well and and then even things like real estate transfer taxes like prices are they seem like they're up again this year however i think volume is going to be down because there's just not as many people moving but just things like that those numbers where we really won't know until we know yeah mm -hmm. um, Tara, what are your thoughts there yeah, so um, most definitely, I think um, Dr. Yannicone said it earlier that we definitely, this is first look, so um, this is where we're recommending. Um, I 100% I understand um, seeing the 3.5 when we're used to being in the twos. Um, we can definitely go back, sharpen pencils, come back with options um, and what it looks like and what the impacts are. I just want to make sure that everybody recognizes and realizes this happens when you're when you're entering in to your first year of your teacher's contract, when you negotiate a teacher's contract and it reopens, it has to get paid for somehow. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And so we're doing everything we can to make sure that we mitigate the tax increase. But I just want to make sure that we don't get into deficit spending with our fund balance, that we make sure that, and that conversation will happen next time. So we'll definitely try to get, you know, make that number lower as, as much as we can to, to minimize the impact on the taxpayer. But we also have to look at the other side of the picture that we have goals and things that we were looking to do and we negotiated contracts or in those contracts for four years, three years. Um, so those numbers aren't gonna change. So I just wanna make sure that we're doing what we need to do to make sure that we cushion to be able to pay for the contracts that we negotiated. And then it doesn't turn into a thing where fund balance starts to pay for reoccurring items. So we will have that, we'll go back to the drawing board, see what we can do, um, mm -hmm. and then make sure that we delineate from fund balance what exactly we're utilizing it for to show that it's the one-time purchases, that it's not something that we're dependent on. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it has been my goal since I got here to present a zero budget balance or a zero mm -hmm. budget um, so that we, our revenues pay for what our expenditures are. So that's, that's mm -hmm. the goal. And hopefully, we're getting there, um, mm -hmm. but we also are doing a lot of work um, that costs money. And we are in an inflation period where, as Dr. Yannicone said, every single one of those line items that you saw, I added decent money to. Um, so there's gonna be areas that I cannot strip away. And you saw the areas that would be impacted if, if we did take away funds or 
we do rely a little bit heavier on fund balance to mitigate the tax increase, which we have done in the past. So mm -hmm. um, definitely doable and uh, sharpen that pencil and get my adding machine going. <laughs> Ms. Um, let me be clear too. Like I, I do think you guys came with a reasonable recommendation mm -hmm. following the guidance that we've been very consistent on, which is come in below fund balance and um, 60 basis points below the, index is actually pretty material like that's so thank you i'm not asking you to come back with a different recommendation i'm asking you to come back with like what is the impact if we wanted to be really um conservative uh, very conservative on tax increase right and, okay. and and the other thing that i think we should have really important discussion around is like what's the long-term impact of being too conservative on tax increases mm -hmm. right like we are in an inflationary period and if you want to get to zero uh, um, surplus deficit, right? So that we're actually spending what we bring in. Like, does this, you know, push us back five years from our ability to do that? And I don't know what the, you know, right way to uh, do the analysis on that, but if you could help us really put that into perspective. Absolutely. Because um, that's the narrative I think, you know, the community is going to want to know is like, you know, we, we have, we don't have a fund balance to do operations. We have fund balance to protect our ability to, to, to do the longer term investments that we want. So, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah, I, I, even going back to the 3.5, I, um, I think that that's reasonable based on everything that's been presented and in the scheme of things. I mean, I just, my cable bill went up 40 bucks. Um, yeah. Granted, I brought it back down. I, I realized <laughs> the savings, but like everything is costing more when, when I have clients asking me what's going to happen with taxes in Springfield, I tell them, well, cost of doing business goes up every year. So you should assume that they're going to go up, but we want to make sure they're going up appropriately. And obviously, you know, the programs that we're running and everything that 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 you're doing is um, fantastic. So we understand, all right, I, you know, I think we all understand the need to not yeah. end up with a shortfall somewhere in the future where yeah. a future board or a future administration is trying to <laughs> pick up the pieces of poor planning. <sighs> yeah. Nobody likes deferred maintenance. And so, you know, I mean, I appreciate, first of all, I appreciate the fact that you recognize Kara's done a, a really good job, a lot of hard work to try to um, tighten this up. Um, th that $200,000, if the governor's budget comes in, is uh, handled. Um, but we won't mm -hmm. know that until much after um, you've uh, approved a proposed final. So, but we've had multiple conversations about the what I consider, it's a real dichotomy because on the one hand, costs are going up and we're all seeing that, right? I just renegotiated my internet bill and dropped my landline for the first time because I decided I'm not, you know, getting into the 300s with Verizon. But um, but at the same time, wages have gone up. So it's that back and forth of, well, the index is suggesting that there's an ability to pay, but, the, but families are also dealing with a lot greater expenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we want to be respectful to our community who's unbelievably supportive. We also want to make sure that we're doing the things that continue to grow the district. So um, mm -hmm. we'll come back um, and we'll do our best to get as close to that 3-1. Um, and mm -hmm. we can show you what a 3-1 obviously will do in both ways. Yeah. Hearing you correctly, right. you want to see that as what would that do to fund balance and what would that do if we eliminated, what would we drop from right. new program? program. Or um, how would we tighten that budget in order to make sure that we could hit that target? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you want to see both what, what's, what's the impact to students and then also um, what would be the impact to, yes. uh, to the overall but, budget. But those, yeah, absolutely. Just, just to clarify that, but those would be two different, like in one case, it's cutting things. And in the other case, it's utilizing more fund balance, right? Yeah. We're looking at two. Okay. Or potentially, uh, uh, you know, as uh, Kara said, if there, if for some reason, and I, I would be shocked if this happened, but if for some reason the state budget were to be solidified, and we were to actually realize that anticipated revenue, remember, Kara didn't factor in that the governor's budget mm -hmm. because we just don't know where that will land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if in theory we were able to see realize some of those benefits, or if the RFPs come in lower than we think for some of these services <laughs> Big enough. anything's possible right so if that <laughs> happened and we can also talk about that differences in contracts mm -hmm. we, we will refine and um 
provide you with the the options at least so that you can see and then decision making yeah. coming and then you know we'll we'll talk about recommendations and obviously we won't we won't recommend anything that'll put us in a negative situation financially so um but, but we'll have the options and for everything for you to see as you requested that's not a problem great thanks okay I, I do want to correct myself um, for Mr. Bedard because I I was using the eight percent off of our fund balance. The eight percent of the state limit for unassigned is off of our budget, so it's a it's closer to five million of what can be in an unassigned. And at the end of the year, that's about what we had in unassigned. So I try to keep it around that area of the eight percent limit um, in the unassigned when we're reallocating and repurposing fund balance. Helpful clarification. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions on a lot of information and numbers? And again, this is first look, so um, we will get to work and do some refining on the numbers and making sure everything's in order and giving you the options that you requested um, for our next discussion. Is everybody okay with April 20, the April 20th date? Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If there's no more questions, then we can adjourn the meeting. Well, I um, just want to, again, extend our thank you uh, to you, Ms. Green, and you, Ms. Janko. I'm, uh, clearly, a tremendous amount of work went into this, so thank you for making it very easy to digest, and um, the presentation was very clear. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Uh, my head is not as good with numbers as the other two um, gentlemen on the call, and <laughs> so it's hard to wrap my head around all of this, um, but I do appreciate the way you went through it um, and the longitudinal comparisons and perspectives. That's really helpful. Thank you. Good. And Dr. Teratuski, your your head is more advanced in so many ways. So <laughs> I, can, I can assure you and speak on behalf of Mr. Frank on that as well. My head hurts today, though. <laughs> I do have to put somebody on the spot on who's providing the presentation, uh, who's the update at the next board meeting. I'm, I'm happy to, I'm always happy to do that. But if someone else Thanks, wants Neil. to do it, like, don't, don't hesitate to say you'll do it. No. <laughs> I, I appreciate it, Neil, because if somebody asks a question, I'm going to go. Uh... <laughs> well, and like, here's here's the thing. I've tried in the past to do my own notes. I love, um, I, um, Ms. Jenko, you, you've you been providing the, who's been providing? Like, I love the minutes. Sometimes okay. I add my own stuff. Sometimes I ramble and don't make any sense. Okay. But I, I appreciate having the minutes to be able to just read, read from if necessary. But yeah. um, but I, I try and take it. notes during these as well. And I, I feel like if I tr jump in between, I'm all over the place. But anyway, I'm happy to, um, okay. to give the report. Okay. Thanks, Neil. We will get the minutes out to you guys. I know Ms. Jenko okay. takes copious notes during these meetings. So... Yeah. We'll provide those. Um, if Great. there's no other questions or comments, we can adjourn the meeting. Okay. Thank, Thank you. For... you. Thank you all. Have a great day. Have a great Take day. Care. Feel feel better, Mary Jo. Thank yeah. you. Feel better. Bye. Bye.